Our help is in the name of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Welcome to this time of worship, whether you are near or far, whether it is Sunday morning or another time during the week, we welcome you to this time of worship in this Advent season. And remind you that this time of worship uh, can be accessed on our YouTube channel, where you are now, uh, Second Pres Lou, 2ND Pres Lou, any time during the week uh, that you are able uh, to join us for worship. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. We worship God. The word of life. The font of identity. The table of sustenance, children of God, welcome home. <laughs> God does not want anyone to perish, but rather for all to come to repentance. Therefore, let us confess our sins together, for God's salvation is at hand. Let us pray. Faithful God, we confess that we have not led lives of holiness. We suffer from impatience, apathy, and greed. We have not been at peace. We repent of these offenses and turn to you in love. Forgive our iniquity and pardon our sins that we may walk in righteousness to the glory of your name. Amen.
brothers and sisters, by the mercy of Christ, your sins are forgiven, for salvation is at hand for all who turn to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. people walking in darkness calling from the wilderness yet seeking the light we see you drawing near from heaven above and so we say come lord jesus come amen amen amen, amen. to hear the word of the Lord. Let us pray a prayer of illumination. We thank you, God, for this beautiful day. We pray that, Lord, you throw your light upon our heart to drive the shade of sin away, even as we prepare to hear your word. In Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. I'm reading from Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 1 to 11. Isaiah 41 to 11. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned that she has received from the Lord's hands double of her sins. A voice cries, 
in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice says, cry. And I say, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the, our God will still stand forever. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not, say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God, behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will turn his flock like a shepherd, he will gather the lambs in his arms, he will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. This is the word of the Lord. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark, the first chapter. I'm reading from the Common English Bible Translation. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, God's Son, happened just as it was written about in the prophecy of Isaiah, look, I'm sending my messenger before you. He will prepare your way. A voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord make his paths straight. John was in the wilderness, calling for people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God to forgive their sins. Everyone in Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went out to the Jordan River and were being baptized by John as they confessed their sins. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locust and wild honey. He announced, one stronger than I am is coming after me. I'm not even worthy to bend over and loosen the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We sent out the usual video on Friday as part of uh, Seconds to Go, our online newsletter. And if you watch that video, you will know that I shared part of a story about our cat, Hannah. Here's the story. About 3.15 Friday morning, I woke to a, a feline face inches from my own face. She was staring at me. She was trying to discern if I was conscious or not. And there was the little paw that was tapping on my eye and tapping on the side of my face. And when it didn't get the desired result, 
she took to a vigorous pawing of the bed sheets. And the message was clear, feed me now. It reminds me of a cartoon from the New Yorker I have on our refrigerator that shows a cat sitting on the bed looking at its owner, its master, and uh, a figure in a black suit standing by and the caption reads, all right, all right, I'll feed you. We don't have to bring the lawyers into it. I ignored her as best I could, and I drifted back to sleep. But in an hour or so, about 4.15, the same routine happened. So I pushed her away again and somehow drifted back to sleep, a light sleep, and finally, when the alarm went off at the normal time, I fed the cat. Thankfully, there has been no such behavior repeated since that time. So I was working on this sermon later on Friday morning in a kind of uh, sleep-deprived, sleep-interrupted fog. And I was thinking about Hannah's behavior as I tried to get a handle on John the Baptist. Here again, the scripture. John was in the wilderness calling for people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives. I baptize you with water, he says, but he, the Messiah, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And John is basically saying, wake up, people. Get moving. Someone is coming who will bring something so good and so new that it cannot be business as usual. You need to get ready. You need to prepare yourself for this new thing. And John is one who will not allow his people to snooze or to ignore or push away the Spirit at work in their lives. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, God's Son, writes Mark. Mark, he's making introductions, if you will. He's saying, here's Jesus. Jesus, a common name for a male Jewish person in those days. But this Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah that Israel's been waiting for. And John is saying, here is the anointed one. The one who, like a king, will rule. The one who will rule not only over Israel, but over all peoples, even over those Romans. His coming is good news. And good news in those days was more than likely how you would describe a dispatch from the battlefield with news of a victory for your side. Good news is coming. His coming is real good news. Unlike that counterfeit good news that's proclaimed at the birth of the Emperor Augustus. Here is the one who is the real son of God. Unlike those Roman emperors who inscribe that title on coins next to their likeness. And so if you are a first century Palestinian Jew and you are fighting Roman oppression, this is inspirational stuff, this is good news, but for most of us, this story is old news. We've heard it all before. We're just into another advent, and in fact, it is an advent that uh, is not particularly appealing. A colleague shared with me this week 
a very brief article from the Christian Century magazine. It referred to one of the most prominent theologians, teachers, preachers, writers in Christian history who also happened to be the pastor of a small church during World War I. And if you were to read through the sermons he preached at that time, you might be surprised to find that he hardly ever made reference to this, this war, this horror of a war, this war that changed the face of Europe, that changed the way people thought about their faith. He hardly ever refers to it. But instead, he speaks of the church and of Christian people living in a unique time of God. And I interpret that expression to mean that they are living in a time when they are to be alert and to stay awake for new revelations, new appearances of Jesus, new opportunities to follow him and to serve him. And you have to make changes in order to get ready for this unique time of God. In this article, a contemporary theologian and writer says he believes that we, right now, are living through a unique time of God. When it comes to our lives, when it comes to our faith, it cannot be business as usual. It's time to wake up to what the Holy Spirit is up to. It's time to change our hearts and lives and to accept, he says, that our dependency upon God is undeniable. Could it be that in this time that is often terrifying, often dark, that the Spirit is pointing us to, that the Spirit is introducing us to Jesus? all over again, or maybe for the first time? And could it be that this Jesus doesn't quite fit our vision of what the Messiah should be, what the Messiah is like? There's a magnificent 16th century altar piece known as the Isenheim altarpiece. And it towered over an altar in a hospital section of a monastery. And back in those days, the monks in that monastery, they specialized in the treatment of a terrible common disease of the Middle Ages called St. Anthony's Fire. And the people who caught this disease often behaved or seemed as if they had gone mad. And the disease restricted blood flow to the extremities and so sadly led to gangrene of hands and, and feet. The central panel of this altarpiece, right in the middle of it, is a crucifixion scene. And standing next to that cross, standing next to the crucified Jesus is John the Baptist. And John is pointing to Jesus with this elongated index finger so that you can't miss the point. He's pointing to this Jesus hanging on the cross. Let's take a look at this altarpiece. The Jesus to whom John is pointing is a Jesus who bears symptoms of that awful disease. 
a greenish tint to his skin, gnarled hands and feet, ugly spots all over his body. And as if John is saying to those poor souls who come to worship in that hospital chapel, as if he's saying, this is your hope when all else seems hopeless. This is the Son of God who understands and knows your suffering. This is the Messiah who knows the despair of death, separation from God, that sense of utter helplessness against the powers of darkness. This is your Savior who is with you and who lifts you from the pit. Those crowds who are fighting their way to the Jordan River, they don't expect to find a powerless, dependent, suffering Messiah they're looking for someone who's charismatic and impressive, a, an impressive savior who has the firepower to overwhelm the, the might of Rome. Someone who can put the fear of God into the unbeliever, the immoral. And I believe that we who long to be back together in this sacred space, we who long to be with family and with friends in a way that is safe and casual. We who long together with others to celebrate all the richness and wonder of life. I don't believe that this is the kind of savior most of the time that we are looking for either. In our moments of brokenness and despair, do we watch for, do we wait for, do we call on this suffering servant? And how often, how often do, we, do we miss seeing him in the faces of those who are desperate and lost? And instead we're, we're looking for him among those with power and authority and who seem to have their lives together. So John calls us, too, to repent, to turn from, and to turn toward the one who is the crucified Messiah, who is our hope. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote from a prison cell, in a time of overwhelming evil and destruction in Nazi Germany, he wrote, only a suffering God can help. Our vision of who God is and how God works fails to comprehend the truth of this Jesus. We need John's persistent call to wake up John's finger pointing us to the suffering Savior. Pope Francis wrote a column recently reflecting on how we live in this unique time of God, how that reveals our values, our commitments, and our priorities. And in this article, he doesn't ever use the word repentance. But he speaks of something that has been prominent in my heart and mind lately. Something I believe is uh, something we must repent from. Something uh, we must turn from. If we are to be ready for the coming of Jesus. And that something is what I like to call a radical individualism. That as the Pope puts it, takes something basically good, something useful, an idea like personal freedom 
and turns it into an ideology, a way of life, and makes it our ultimate value. The illusion of self-sufficiency, that I don't need anyone's help, that we are responsible only for ourselves and our safety and our comfort. The fantasy of being in control of our lives and the lives of other people, all of that runs head on into the fears and the uncertainties and the isolation that we often experience these days. And all of that conflicts with that picture, that image to which John points of the crucified Messiah the one who insists that true life comes as we give ourselves away, as we give our lives away. That true freedom comes only as we focus on the needs of others first. That true peace comes only as we let go of our futile attempts to control and instead hand our lives over to the one who rules all things with mercy. In this unique time of God, I believe that's the Jesus we need to meet. The Jesus that we are dying to meet. And to God be the glory now and forever. Amen. With believers in every time and place, let us affirm what it is we believe using the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
flesh will certainly see the glory of the Lord, and it is the glory of the Lord that shines brightly into our lives, even in places and spaces we don't always recognize. We are grateful for the ways that God's light, God's glory continues to shine in our lives, uh, uh, particularly in this season of Advent as we celebrate together light from light. There are many ways that we can uh, let God's light shine in our lives this season. Uh, This evening at 5 o'clock there will be an opportunity for a Vesper service. That will be on Zoom and that link went out in seconds to go and will be sent out later today as well. A Bible study on Wednesday evenings at 6.30 p.m. uh, looking at Advent texts around light. That will also be on Zoom and went out in seconds to go. We hope that you will participate in that. Or come by today and get an Advent bag with um, opportunity to make your own Advent wreath and Bible studies, devotions for families and adults, and a hymn book, a way in which you at home can participate in this time together. Today is the last day to pick up your Advent bag, so please come by and do that if you have not done so already. And on December 16th, a service of light, sometimes called a longest day service, a time where we will wrestle with the hurts and the pains of the past year and wrap them up in the hope that is ours this season that God's light shines even into the darkest places of our lives. That service will be available on our YouTube channel at noon on December 16th and we hope that you will join us for that time of worship. And even Christmas Eve, We hope you will join us. We will have three services on Christmas Eve as we normally do. Two of them will be a bit different this year as they will be outside in our chapel circle like we did this summer. At 5 p.m., a candlelight outdoor service, and then again at 10 p.m., candlelight outdoor service. Between those services, we'll have a live streamed uh, lessons and carol service with communion. We hope that you will join us for worship on Christmas Eve. And our work in the community as we share grace, not just with one another, but with the world around us continues as well. And we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all those who gave to our Christmas Cabbage Patch. Uh, We did meet our goal of $20,000 to support families at the Cabbage Patch this Christmas. So what an amazing accomplishment. What a gift of grace that is. If you have not given uh, to the COVID-19 fund, uh, we invite you to do so. And also a special opportunity for our children and youth to write letters of welcome to our two newest refugee families. All of that information can be found in seconds to go. We hope that you will participate in those opportunities of service. As we prepare to celebrate the sacrament of communion this morning, Uh, We invite you to make sure that you have uh, the elements available with you. And as we enter into this time of prayer, uh, we remember some folks within our community who need our prayers. We remember the Nichols family uh, on the death of Robert last week. Remember the the Kemp family, especially Carol and sister, the death of Harcourt Kemp earlier this week. And we remember Patrice Patton the unexpected death of her beloved nephew, Zeke Snow. And in this time of grief, we also celebrate uh, the wedding of Caroline Wells and Nathan Dickin yesterday that happened here, and we celebrate with the Wells family this morning. So now, as people in need of a word of hope and of peace, let us come to this table and be reminded of God's grace. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. At this table we are given a foretaste, a preview of that great day when God's reign will come in its fullness 
and all will gather at the table of Jesus Christ and be fed and be made new and life will be as it is intended to be from the beginning of creation. This table is not the table of this church or denomination, it is Christ's table. And we invite you, you who are gathered with us, uh, to join in this great feast this day. The Lord be with you. And also so with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift, lift them, them up to, to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to, to give, give our thanks, thanks and praise. praise. Let us pray. How can we thank you, O God, for sun and moon and stars, for breath and life and all things good, for your steadfast promise and your faithful love, for the day that is surely coming when all things will be made new, with saints, with angels, and with the whole creation, we join the ancient and eternal hymn saying, Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. We give you thanks, holy God, for Jesus who came to be your living word, to baptize us with your spirit and fire, to feed the hungry, to humble the mighty, and announce the good news of your coming realm. With thanksgiving, we remember how, when the hour had come, Jesus took his place at the table with the apostles. With thanks and praise, we offer ourselves to you, sharing this holy meal, remembering Christ's dying and rising, and praying, Come, Lord Jesus. Christ, Christ has, has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ will come again. So we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit upon this bread and this cup and these people. Christ, body and blood given in love for the world. Make us one spirit, one in the church and one with Christ our Lord. Make us gentle, joyful, thankful people, serving our neighbors and worshiping you Keep us in the peace of Christ until you gather us at your table in glory. For even now a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Through Christ, in Christ, with Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. And so we pray together as you taught us, saying, Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup, is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For friends, every time we eat this bread, and we drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. And friends, he will come again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We invite you at home to share this meal with one another using the words, the body of Christ broken for you, and the blood of Christ shed for you. If you are alone, know that you are never alone, for God's spirit is with you even there. Let us keep the feast.
Let us pray. God, our hope, we give you thanks that you have given us a foretaste of the justice, righteousness, and peace of your promised new creation. Strengthen us with this heavenly food as we seek to serve you. Lead us to live in joyful expectation of the coming again and glory of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now the peace of God which passes all understanding. Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>